Uh, my name is Collins Otieno Diambo. I'm the project lead for the LabCorp, and I'm glad to be your host today. So today our speaker will be Dr. George Allenji, who is the Senior Technical Advisor for Laboratory Services at the Office of the US Global AIDS Coordinator and Health Diplomacy, known as OGAG, and he'll be talking about PEPFAR laboratory priorities in the COP 2021. Just a reminder that you register your name and your organization into the chat box as we start, and also any subsequent questions that you'll be having, uh, please just put them there and we will follow up. Just as a start to this session, I'll be sharing with you uh, our, I'll be sharing with you a framing presentation that puts into perspective uh, what we want to discuss today. Uh, the main actions from LabCorp is to ensure that uh, that action plans are linked to funding. Uh, I hope you can see my screen, all of you. So just a reminder that in November last year, we held a face-to-face -face virtual meeting uh, because of the COVID situation. And within that meeting, we are able to review progress from the last face-to-face uh, -face meeting in Addis in 2019. And countries were able to identify gaps and come up with priorities for intervention. Uh, we analyzed that data from the countries and these were the domains that uh, the countries highlighted mainly. The, 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 the most countries, nine out of 13, highlighted result utilization as a gap that needs to be addressed. Uh, seven countries highlighted sample transportation. Uh, six countries uh, highlighted waste management and biosafety and supply chain and equipment maintenance. Four countries highlighted uh, the anal analytical phase of viral load testing cascade as an issue, and four others mentioned demand creation. Diving uh, into these areas, so for result utilization, the key gap mentioned by most countries was that there was no information on enhanced adherence counseling at the national level, yet this was being uh, done at facility level, and countries plan to either add these indicators uh, onto the existing MRD tools or add them onto the online DHIS2 system. Other issues were that uh, HIV clinical and programmatic data were still in paper form and were hard to analyze. So some countries have proposed that they want to expand uh, digitization by using existing electronic medical records either by uh, adding them to more sites, more clinics, so that data can be readily available. The other issue that came up was on the use of viral load results to inform patient management. Uh, there's still a long turnaround time for these results, so they end up not being used to manage patients. So four out of the nine countries would like to implement or expand uh, e-labs, smart care, or SMS return of results. So we'll be engaging those four countries further after this meeting. The other issue was a knowledge gap in terms of switching patients on treatment and also having the switch committees in place. So some countries have, have planned to strengthen these switch committees and also to sen sen sensitize uh, the healthcare workers. Sample transport, uh, Mainly countries say there's insufficient coverage of viral load testing, and they want to do this by optimizing equipment placement based on the global information system and also the target population. Others also indicate a long turnaround time and they'd like to uh, develop policies that can lead to faster transport of samples, maybe riding on uh, other existing uh, sample networks that are more regular. The issue of supply chain management also came up. Uh, there's an issue of uh, 
tracking supplies at facility level and, and a number of countries want to make this electronic. There's also fragmented procurement whereby commodities meant for testing are purchased by different partners. And so there's a need to uh, integrate uh, supply chain. The issues of waste management still come up. There are lack of policies and guidelines. So waste is not properly managed uh, within the healthcare facilities. And uh, currently we are aware that PEFA is supporting a number of countries to develop national guidelines and policies to address uh, waste management. A number of countries also indicated lack of proper infrastructure like uh, absence of uh, incinerators and uh, they plan to procure this either through uh, PEPFA Global Fund or other public private partnerships. So I will stop sharing. George, I think you can go ahead now. Thank you. Okay. Right. Good morning, everyone. And thanks, um, Collins, for that um, quick uh, summary of uh, your outcome. That will definitely save us a discussion starter for what I'm presenting because it really uh, ties in with a lot of the, the issues that uh, the PEPFAR program um, is supporting. So my name is George Alemji. I serve as a senior technical advisor for laboratory services for PEPFAR. I'm at uh, SGAG in Washington. So this is uh, usually an annual event uh, during which I come in to present uh, the laboratory priorities for PEPFAR for the coming year. Once the PEPFAR, uh, what we call the PEPFAR Country Operational Plan uh, Guidelines is released. This is an annual uh, cycle of activities that the PEPFAR program goes through. The COP guideline or what we see is COP or ROP, ROP, P is the regional operational plan and COP is a country operational plan. Some of our programs are bilateral with countries, some are regional. So every year we develop this document, which is a very high level policy guided document to show how the programs or activities for the coming year are being implemented. Uh, it is very, very all inclusive. We start with a draft document. Once it is ready, we send out through what we call the public view and everyone has the opportunity to, to contribute. So the current guideline has received input from Global Fund WHO, everyone that has um, interest in reviewing this document. So what we are sharing is not just uh, a PEPFAR perspective, it's also involved other stakeholders and the countries as well. So we, 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 we start, let me just go back. Right, so uh, my presentation will be in this order. I definitely will start with providing some, uh, the guiding principles of PEPFAR and some of the latest uh, global results. We'll talk about a uh, case uh, finding, which is very, very important. <laughs> Uh, testing uh, coverage, uh, two months early infant diagnosis, and then a TB diagnosis to include both adults and children. Then, of course, I'm going to provide a series of uh, strategies and recommendations within the guidelines for countries to use in addressing some of the challenges. And I will end up with uh, the, some of the COVID-19 uh, adaptations. So uh, PEPFAR really, really operates uh, based on three guiding uh, principles. We always talk about uh, accountability, the need for us to be accountable and maximize all the profits and the funding that goes for every program is very, very important. We also talk about transparency. Just as I mentioned earlier, it's an open process. It's all inclusive with input from all the partners and all collaborators. Operators, WHO, Global Fund, Unity, everyone uh, participates in this pro uh, process, including the civil society, the private sector, and the first based organizations. And of course, we'll look at impact. What is the outcome of the interventions? What is the data saying? And where are the gaps? And where next do we want to go? So that is how the PEPFAR program operates. Now, I just want to share some of the latest uh, results. Uh, that PEFA has uh, accomplished working with partners and countries over the years. This data was actually shared during the uh, 2020 World Aids Day in December, so it's, uh, it's something that you can always reference from anywhere. But you can see uh, PEFA has done a lot over the years, um, of over 25 million um, programs uh, supported uh, 
people on uh, voluntary medical may, uh, circumcision. We're talking about uh, 2.8 million babies uh, born uh, HIV free. We have a program called DREAMS and also the OVC, which is really targeting the orphans and vulnerable children, and also the adolescent girls and the young girls. This is something that the perfect in collaboration with other stakeholders have done so well. And most importantly, I want to mention this uh, 17 million uh, women, men, and children uh, have actually benefited from the live uh, seven antiretroviral programs, uh, thanks to the PEPFAR program. And also, a um, lot of people have benefited from training, pay a lot of attention on human resource needs and training, including the laboratory uh, staff that we support in multiple countries. So let's pay attention now to what are the key issues in terms of uh, case finding. Of course, this is very, very critical in support of the, the first uh, 95, UNS 95. So just to make sure that um, everything goes as planned, uh, in terms of diagnosis, PEPFAR strongly and is still uh, supporting the HIV uh, rapid testing that we've supported over the years, is a way to go. Of course, centralized testing would not lead to improvement in diagnostics. So rapid testing is at the top. And within that, we pay a lot of attention also to what we call the HIV rapid testing, continuous quality improvement. Quality of diagnosis, as you know, is critical. Don't just one result, but one result that are quality assured. And of course, the HIV uh, self testing is something that was not getting prominence in the past, but more recently, and also within the, the COVID-19, we've seen that HIV self testing is the way to go. So there's also a lot of support in that area to improve uh, case uh, case finding. Recency testing is something that PEFA has supported for the past three to four years. Again, I want to make it very clear that it's not um, part of HIV diagnosis for the country program. It comes after this diagnosis and the excellence is to differentiate between recent and the long-term infection. And we've seen the impact of recency testing in most country programs that it helped us to, to zero down to the hotspots, right? Look at the areas in which area you see more recent infection and that also support more of a target intervention rather than being all over the place looking for. Uh, people to diagnose. And of course, PrEP is uh, also gaining a lot of uh, support and PEPFA lays a lot of emphasis on how we ensure that those who are participating in PrEP are truly negative. Remember, PrEP is for people who are at risk and they are taking this uh, prophylaxis to prevent HIV infection. So they must be diagnosed negative. So we really want to avoid people being erroneously placed on ARVs when they are HIV positive and it wasn't known. So pay a lot of attention on PrEP uh, diagnosis. And again, the recommendation is that once someone is on PrEP three to four months, there's a repeat testing. So pay a lot of attention on that. Now, viral load uh, testing coverage and suppression, of course, is a 1090 and it's very, very critical. But now we keep on seeing some challenges that I really want to start with some data analysis, more recent data showing you where we are and uh, how um, we plan to address some of the issues. One is, um, this slide is really telling us what we saw uh, more recently or throughout last year uh, due to the impact of COVID-19. Now I'll be talking about quarter. So when I mention quarter four, I'm talking about a PEPFA cumulative data right up to September, 2020. So if you look at this, we we'll try to look at it, the comparing uh, the, the time points between 2019 and 2020. And you would realize that in 2019, from Q1 to Q4, there was a cumulative increase in uh, viral load uh, testing coverage. But when you look at the 2020 due to the impact of COVID, right from the Q2, uh, you start seeing a uh, decrease in uh, testing coverage for viral load. And I think the mirrors what we saw uh, with uh, the, the child data that was shared some times ago in collaboration with Unity and, uh, and the WHO, that um, COVID-19 actually infected viral load testing. Lots of the countries, I would say, have actually re uh, recovered from this. They are doing well and even surpassing where they're supposed to be, but some countries are still struggling. So there's need to pay uh, special attention to that. Now, this slide is looking at a big picture uh, in terms of the PEPFAR targets of at least 80% testing coverage and also a 95% uh, suppression. 
uh, at this point, uh, of course, a lot of countries are making progress towards um, the 80% uh, coverage and more, uh, but few uh, are make at, at 95%. So really just four of the PEPFAS supported uh, country programs have actually uh, achieved at least 80% uh, coverage and 95% suppression. So again, there's a need for more emphasis on how to really, really accelerate both testing coverage and suppression. Now, this is uh, the pregnant uh, women compared with the general population. We've seen this throughout all the programs that in almost all the countries except uh, Tanzania that I'm seeing here, uh, testing coverage for pregnant women and even breastfeeding women is generally low. So that is something we need to deal with seriously. We know what it means in terms of viral load uh, testing coverage for pregnant and breastfeeding women and also the need for suppression, which is a proxy for reduction in uh, trans vertical transmission. However, I do have a couple of um, explanations here. Uh, what we've seen in some of the program is that these women are actually not, not that they don't have results, but sometimes the results are there, but because of the weak data system, they are classified as a general population and not um, as such as pregnant or breastfeeding women. So one of the recommendations would definitely be improvement in data system and ensure that data for pregnant and breastfeeding women is captured as such. This uh, slide is very important. Again, I'm talking about um, looking at um, program data from 2017 to 2019, three years, comparing coverage and suppression. I just want to make a point here about this issue that we're not seeing that sort of um, accelerated improvement in viral load suppression over the years compared to, 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 to coverage. You can see that from 2017 to 2019, there was tremendous improvement in all the countries. But overall, they still this 15 to 20% viral load suppression gap, and it's not making any progress. So there's need for us to make more uh, progress and address some gaps to ensure that we improve both coverage and suppression. And I, down the road, I, again, I have a couple of uh, suggestions to make. Then this slide looks at what we've seen again throughout most of the program. The low viral load testing coverage for infants, uh, children, and suppression, both coverage and suppression is all over the programs, not in specific countries. And it is time for us to begin to think about those client-centered and community uh, focused approaches. I have some examples to share that we need to do to address uh, both uh, viral testing coverage and suppression for children across all programs and across the different regions. So the two months EID is um, making progress, but again, not where it should be. This uh, slide is also looking at um, PEPFAR data during uh, COVID. Uh, similar to what we saw for the unit for the uh, child WH supported data, we did not see much impact on COVID-19 with EID at two months compared to viral load. And what we hear is that because there was prioritization, which is good, I think we also make similar uh, recommendations for us to prioritize viral load for pregnant and breastfeeding women and infants during this period. But we did not see much impact on this for. EID at two months, but the overall coverage is still low. 77% is not where we want to be. We want to be at at least 90%. So there's still room for improvement in this area. Again, we're looking at uh, some of the specific country data. This slide is really telling us that at this point, um, just uh, about three of the PEPFAR supported countries have actually crossed, uh, crossed the threshold of at least 90%. A two months EID coverage. Lots of our program are making progress, but again, there's need to accelerate this progress. Then let's talk about uh, TB. We know TB has been a challenge over the years, particularly because of challenges with um, the safeguard and the service warranties that were never respected, uh, no service maintenance, and so on. But over the last couple of years and work together with uh, the IDC, uh, there has been improvement with Safia and the engagement with countries with what we call the social or the bond arrangement. I have this slide to share, which is a great work coming from Uganda, one of the PEPFAR supported countries that has done so well within the last couple of um, years with uh, TB coverage. We've seen this also in many other countries, but like countries that have actually moved away from those uh, initial engagement with Safia and they are now really looking into the new approaches of uh, service and maintenance and having some of the repair stations and spare parts in country. So Uganda has done extremely well. And what we hear from them 
is how the country has been able to work closely and the Ministry of Red, I think, sign uh, I'm OU with, with Safeyard in that light in terms of the, the, all in, the, the supply uh, the, the arrangement and so charge boundary arrangement. And uh, of course, the country has made tremendous progress in improving demand for, for, for TB uh, testing. We see demand creation challenges being across all the programs, both for viral load EID. So Uganda has done so much in that area in improving demand for testing. There is also uh, improvement in terms of integrated uh, sample uh, transport system. I think that is what WHO is telling us to do, not to work silo. And of course, the multiplexing. What we hear is that in this country, as uh, recommended, um, even the gene expert instrument, they are not just used for TB, but multiplexing and also being used for viral load and so on. And in that package, you're able to put in menu uh, that supports your program. So um, uh, this is a good example here that we can learn uh, from uh, Uganda. Again, um, this is just an example. Many other uh, country programs are doing this and it's good to tap into those uh, best uh, practices. So as I mentioned earlier, I have a couple of um, um, suggestions and recommendations and way forward. Very important for us is to literally be talking about uh, the client-centered approach. This is the way to go. We want to look into approaches that take services to the patients wherever they live, not the other way around where patients are going around and looking for services. So think about community engagement that also lead to increase in demand for viral load and EID that I talk about, including TB testing. Of course, one of the approaches is also what we call the community or household sample uh, collection is really coming up as a way to go, particularly in the midst of uh, the COVID and also reduction in terms of who moves to the central level for sample collection. So think about get, getting closer to the patients in collecting samples. Improvement in turnaround time is what we talk about all the time. So I think about your menu of operations and your uh, instrumentation and also sample flow and patient flow. Think about how do you quickly uh, get results back to your patients. Very important is something that was in COP guidelines last year. Uh, the request was to ensure that patients get their results, but that big first get results was a little bit complicated because there are no data system that can actually provide actual results to patients. So the recommendation is to think about that sort of data system that can alert patients that their results are ready. Just an SMS, a text message that goes to the patient at the same time that a copy of the results is going to the facilities or to the clinic would be very helpful. That would make the patient to also take some responsibility and of course visit the clinic to see the, the, the doctors. Of course, the use of point of care, I would uh, discuss more about that. And also, also a quick action on the known uh, surprise viral load result. I talked about it earlier, but I'm going to share some uh, examples from one of the countries. I mentioned um, the issue, the need for us to think about getting closer to patients in terms of sample collection and even delivery of medication. So there's something called the last mile delivery for supply chain that is coming up and uh, is really articulated in the COP guidelines. More of the client center approaches that programs should really pay uh, attention to. Then of course the use of point of care, I really want to spend a little couple of uh, minutes on this slide because it's very, very important. Um, over the years, uh, following uh, the best practices and results that came out to show that uh, point of care is a way to go. The PERFAB program has made this recommendation. Last year, there was a recommendation to also consider the use of point of care for both uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women and the non-suppressed population. New to this COP 2021, we have also included the, the need to consider use of point of care for viral load among children and infants. And this makes a whole lot of sense because of multiple concerns with the use of the venal puncture and the absence of phlebotomies. Sometimes you don't have the appropriate needles for these children. But again, you had a situation where the mother's sample is collected and tested using the point of care, and the baby uh, sample is collected and packaged and taken somewhere else. I think that is not the way to go. So in terms of that sort of family-centered testing and uh, the client-centered testing, let's have both baby and mother samples collected and tested at the same point using the point of care. And uh, consider using your conventional or centralized platform only when the point of care uh, facility does not uh, exist. And of course, uh, the recommendation to use point of care for early infant diagnosis has been uh, over the years and it continues. Now, this is uh, the particular figure I'm talking about in terms of 
developing best practices to address issues around the known suppressed population. This is a good example from South Sudan. Um, this country actually constructed what we define as a high viral load uh, casket. Just uh, by constructing this casket, and you can see from this data, we can quickly identify where the gaps are coming from. You start with 100% of the known suppressed population, but as you go through the first, second, and the third enhanced adherence council, you can see a huge drop. So that is really definitely where you should be paying attention to. There are very few people, just about 41% of the patients actually had a repeat viral load uh, testing. So this is not an issue of lack of instrument or capacity. It's the issue of drop out or loss to follow up of the patients along the casket. So think about really establishing what we call the high viral load register so that all these patients' information can be pulled together. Think about uh, constructing such a casket. And this would definitely help bridge that 15 to 20% gap that we are seeing uh, in terms of the known suppressed population. We need to move this faster to 95%. Uh, suppression in all our programs. Of course, uh, the TB, I mentioned the TB testing before, but really important is for us again to begin to think about TB testing in the context of the country's national program, diagnostic network optimization, and also considering the use of the TB, the gene expert, of course, that is, has been the test, uh, the instrument of choice, but other options are coming up. In case of any resistance, consider the TB culture and the molecular drug uh, susceptibility. And also, we in the COP guidelines for the past year, there's been a recommendation to use uh, the use of LAM, the TB LAM, but it's not happening. So this is a point of care test that can be easily conducted and really help um, to uh, screen patients. So consider that seriously along uh, the other uh, options that you have, but I think this is something that we need to pay special attention to. Um, we, again, I talk about TB and want to pay special at attention to a TB diagnosis among infants. It's been seen that it's very, very low, lower than even what we see for the adults. And there are spe special issues, but like the type of sample that you use and also method of detection. So the COP guidelines certainly um, gives a lot of examples for programs to consider to improve TB uh, diagnosis for both adults and infants. Now. CD4 has been um, a sticky issue. Uh, we've not supported CD4, mass CD4 testing in the past because uh, once there was a recommendation to use viral load as a test of choice to monitor treatment, there was also a recommendation to scale down on CD4 because of lack of resources. At this point, uh, advanced diseases have become very important. So there's now that strong recommendation to consider the use of uh, CD4. Uh, just in that context of uh, supporting and determining and following up patients with advanced diseases. And also, I want to consider in, uh, individuals who have been on the, on the, out of treatment for more than a year, if they are returning back to care, then of course, they need uh, a CD4 test. And also, uh, documented uh, people with documented baremia for over a year period. And also, in the country programs, if you see that um, people from certain area, patients, have uh, advanced diseases uh, incident in that area is uh, up to about 15% or more. You want to consider the use of uh, CD4. For the PEPFAR program, we are not considering uh, instrumentation as such. So we think about those really point of care CD4 tests, something that can just tell us if that uh, patient CD4 is 200 uh, or less or more, uh, particularly uh, things that will not cost much. Um, the VSIC tech which just came out is a typical example. So programs should consider that and things that is not going to cost a low lot of uh, funding to, to implement. But again, it's just to address issues around uh, advanced diseases, not to think about patients' eligibility for treatment or treatment monitoring. Then of course, the diagnostic network optimization is what we've been saying all the time. Uh, is something that a program that implemented is saw the benefits, particularly during uh, COVID, where you saw that they were able to leverage these resources and together quickly uh, support uh, COVID-19 testing. So programs should think uh, carefully how to do this. There's evidence that it will lead to, of course, increase in your testing menu. We've seen that in many other, other country programs, even though some people think no, but that is a way to go. Uh, uh, network efficiency is also seen to have improved in countries that have implemented is the data is there. Of course, decrease in costs and also it creates an opportunity uh, for us to have a, a, a menu of options in front of us and also reduce, uh, improve competition among the different um, 
manufacturers. I have this uh, data to share uh, Nigeria, uh, one of the PEPFAR countries that have done so well with their DNO. Uh, this data is shown how this country, after uh, conducting a complete uh, network optimization, they were able to optimize and able to improve functioning. Uh, that led to reduction in total number of labs that were not efficient. And of course, they introduced what we call the mega labs. You can think about the many of your instrumentation, how to high throughput instruments and improve on your sample transport system and data system. So Nigeria is uh, one of the countries that have done so well. Many other countries are there, but again, I just took this and it's a good example to see how their program did so well. And you can see that tremendous improvement in viral load testing coverage from the cure two of to cure four, uh, which is really amazing. So programs should consider this uh, seriously. Then of course, I just uh, again want to emphasize the need for us to gravitate towards a diagnostic integration, which is the way to go. We've said this all the time. And once you think about having your programs in that approach and seeing it at a national level, it supports the entire testing to also address issues around uh, unknown diseases. I mean, I think COVID told, has taught us that we need to think beyond where we are, prepare for the unknown. And unless until we have a national integrated system, that is not going to be possible. This slide, I just repeating, you've seen it all the time, just talking about what COVID uh, did to all of us and how programs were able to wrap around and support it. Multiplexing, use your instruments appropriately and make sure that it supports diseases across the board. Develop your data system to monitor, uh, set up your um, SOPs and make sure our country programs are working as a team at, at national level. Then of course, the PEPFAR program uh, learned a lot from what the UNITE did earlier with um, the what we call the global request for proposal, the RFP. It's a new menu, new approach to developing programs to interact with diagnostic manufacturers in such a way that we don't take too much responsibility again. We've seen over the years with challenges with instrument downtime, no service contracts, stock out, and also issues of sample movement because of the fact that manufacturers leave everything in the hands of us. So this approach uh, PEPFAR started last year and it's working so well. And it's now well articulated in our PEPFAR COP21 guidelines. We have about six country programs that have done this and it's shown the benefits are all there. It leads to improvement in your performance, reduction of in cost. We, so far, we've seen anticipated cost saving for almost more than 20 million since a uh, March that we met in South Africa and countries that are implementing these uh, programs. And uh, when we were in South Africa, for those countries that got it right, the Ministry of Health, Global Fund, Unity, and all the stakeholders present were so impressed with the ROFP. It's a way to go, so we will continue to engage a global fund and other stakeholders to see everyone can move into this menu. That uh, helps take us away from uh, outright instrument uh, procurement, and we go through what we call the all-inclusive pricing. The manufacturer take responsibility for the instruments and reagents, and you pay cost per test. That has worked so well. And we want to ensure that this apply to both the point of care and conventional platforms, both in terms of cartridges and reagents and so forth. And of course, countries that have actually fully implemented their DNO have been able to benefit from this uh, most. Again, I, I can quote quite a number of them, but if you look at um, the, the, the IS data that was shared, I think uh, Nigeria presented, Zimbabwe, Cameroon, and many other countries that saw how a food DNO together with many of all inclusive pricing were able to support them in raveling around and also in supporting the COVID-19 testing. Biosafety, I would not uh, say so much about this because this is something that the PEPFAR program has supported over the years in terms of training, procurement, and even setting up incinerators. But we have a new, um, another, uh, I would say, I, I don't know what call it, an elephant uh, that has come into the house again, is this recent uh, ways that we see with the cartridges particularly for the, the point of care and near point of care instruments, and also some of our, our reagents. So we continue with that support, but uh, I don't, I hope uh, Anafi would be on this, on this call because uh, much of this is coming through coordination within the IDC, uh, being coordinated by ASLM, Anafi, and also our CDC International Lab Branch are working on this. So lots of attention has to be paid to waste management uh, as we, we implement activities. Now I'm trying to look into 
what were the plausible uh, issues that uh, led to or, or that affected viral load, EID, and other testing uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19. Um, we need to look into that because when we talk about how to address them, it's good to know what were the issues. We saw that lockdown uh, was a very, very uh, critical issue that led to closures of the clinics, re restriction and movement of people, and also the fear of COVID-19 infection was something that came up very strong from some of the data that we gathered. Of course, uh, impacted and uh, affected sample uh, transport for most of the program. And also the fact that multiplexing came into play, it was strange uh, for everyone. So once some of the HIV uh, platforms, uh, particularly around May and April, were being used for COVID, uh, there was that reduction in testing because program was teaching about how to adjust and fit into this uh, new menu. And of course, some of the molecular testing staff also were just the one in country. So they had to be shifted to support COVID-19, which is good and understood. But again, as I said, a lot of the programs have actually adjusted and uh, they are back to where they are. But there's a need to continue to think about how to work together to ensure that anything that comes up, we address. We have COVID-19 uh, today. We don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. And of course, uh, think about the supply chain issue. We saw a lot of challenges, uh, particularly with supply chain when uh, the flights were restricted. And even when flight, when uh, the products were in country, distribution to different laboratories was a challenge. So think about that, uh, consider some of these, uh, particularly what we define as essential staff. Then in terms of what should we be doing uh, as a COVID-19 mitigation strategies, there are quite a number of things. We've seen review a lot of our PEFAR program. A lot of country programs have very, very good, good idea, innovations that we've learned a lot from those programs on what they did in order to catch up. So I just have a couple of uh, suggestions here, but there's a lot out there. WHO has a lot of information on what programs should be doing to ensure safety of both patients and also healthcare workers in terms of COVID and any other outbreak. Think about those social distance measures that will reduce wait time for people to come to the facilities, reduction and think about staggering in terms of visit. Uh, consider the use of a dry blood spot, collect samples and move them to laboratory rather than everyone coming in for sample uh, collection. Consider the use of things like the point of care uh, platform because that setting would not encourage a lot of people to come in. And also improvement in your sample transport system. We've seen that a lot of programs are not doing well because of movement of samples. So if you have to collect DBS, then of course the transport uh, system has to be in place. Now, let me sum it up with uh, what we uh, in, the, in the PEPFAR space consider the minimum program requirement. This is where stated in the guidelines again, but we're saying that in case you are not able to do a lot, this is really what you should be doing for your country program. Lots of programs have done this. So we're talking about the DNO that I mentioned earlier, which is very critical for us to do in terms of uh, strategies to address the low viral load and EID testing that we've talked about and also TB, but make sure that minimum, minimum requirement within this package ensures things like the complementary um, use of both your point of care and centralized platforms. Very important. People think that when they have systemic problems with their centralized platform, they should abandon and then run to go use point of care. That doesn't address the issue. Address your systemic problems, conduct your optimization, and make sure that these platforms are used exactly where they should be. Of course, I've talked about the TV, uh, HIV diagnostic integration and multiplexing, something I don't want to, again, spend more time on. And then, of course, they need to ensure that your data system is up and running. Make sure results get out there. A lot of results are hanging back in the laboratory and within the facilities and patients are not informed. The MSM has also shown to work. We've seen that work in a couple of countries. Please think about something simple that can simply put, drop a message, a text message in the phone of your patients that their results are ready. So I would not end up with that really, again, emphasizing PEPFAS, very, very important uh, principle, which is coordination. We pay a lot of attention on coordination with all the stakeholders, Global Fund, WHO. In fact, all what I'm presenting is not thanks to PEPFAS. I would say thanks to everyone, Global Fund, that is an important stakeholder, WHO, the country team, the Ministry of Health, all the staff, everyone has been part of this. So let's continue to stay and ensure that, that coordination works. We do have what we call the, diagnostic, the integrated diagnostic consortium that brings all of us together. So let's stay within that umbrella 
and uh, the, the Vatican initiative. And most importantly, I think now we have the African CDC that is out there uh, based within the African Union and leading the entire continent. I think we fully and we should continue to support the African CDC led initiatives, work together with ASLM and all the uh, local institutions. And PEPFAR, in fact, is paying a lot of attention on implementing partners and building local capacity. We want to ensure that there are programs that are sustainable and long term. So when this funding comes into the continent, please pay attention and make sure that you promote and support your local partners so that you can now build a national capacity. These sort of consultants who come in and from airport to meetings and back to airport is not supporting your country program. Think about building local capacity for long-term sustainability. And of course, the government lead this program. Let's us know that these are country programs owned and led by the government. We are always supporting. So let us not override the government and seen program like being driven by us, but it should be hosted and led by the government and we all support. Um, this is uh, really my last slide. And again, I want to use this opportunity to thank first the African Society for Laboratory Medicine for giving PEPFAR the opportunity to present this um, COP21 guidelines or uh, we are the, the laboratory priorities that we are considering. As I speak now, uh, the country programs are actually having in-country retreat in developing their draft COP guidelines. And in March, February, March, we're still having those big um, level meetings to talk about this. And I know all the stakeholders are part of it. So please, if you are in each of the country programs, make sure that your program is integrated. It's not a silo program. Invite all stakeholders, the civil society, the private sector, the faith-based organizations, and all the other stakeholders. With that, I want to thank you all. Over. Yeah, thank you, George. That was a good presentation. And you raised some best practices that mean that uh, the solutions are actually within us. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, Nigeria, in terms of diagnostic network optimization, Uganda in terms of uh, CEPHID uh, TB coverage, uh, South Sudan in terms of the cascade and tracking it, and there were good practices in terms of integrating sample transport. Uh, I hope the countries can now uh, learn from one another. And in terms of opportunities, I, I think all the issues that were raised by the LabCorp countries can be addressed probably through um, the PEPFAR Corp, and if not, through other funding sources like Global Fund, Unitaid, and even Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now there are a couple of questions that came up uh, in the chat box at, as you discussed. So I'll start with the Shadra query. He's asking that, can you tell us what PEPFAR is doing about uh, OIs? especially managing cryptococcal meningitis, which is almost 7% in HIV-infected patients. Have they set up funds for countries to do screening like they do for TB? Yes, uh, thank you so much. That is right. PEPFA uh, is fully supporting uh, all the OIs. Uh, this year, uh, for the COP guidelines, is very, very clear. There's a section that talks about PEPFAR limited support for chemistry and hematology, but in terms of OIs, um, including crypto, uh, also TB and all OIs, there's funding there and it's very, very clear. We have what we call the first commodity tool. You will see that uh, listed. So that support uh, has been there. And of course, now that we talk about advanced diseases, that is something that is part of the menu to really ensure that patients with advanced diseases receive the support they need. Over. Thank you. Uh... Dr. Ernest Makoa from Kenya is asking if the improvement in expert utilization in Uganda integrates with other existing transport and lab systems. Uh, that is what I, they, they actually talk about um, integrated uh, sample transport system. Yes, I think that is it. And I think um, if there is there any, any colleague from Uganda to say more about it, but as far as I know, um, they talk about integrated sample uh, transport system, which has been part of the reason why they're doing so well. Okay, thank you. I think we'll reach out to Uganda as well to try to share that in our LabCorp sessions, one of them. Another question from Dr. Pascal. I do not see any intervention to guide suppressed patients 
to less intense model of care. It might free resources to better control the non-suppressed. Can you comment on this? Yes, I, I think I mentioned the fact that one, the very first thing that we'll talk about the client-centered uh, approaches and the community-based approaches, and also the need to uh, set up what we call the high barrel uh, load um, uh, registers and also control this cascade. But more to that, in our PEPFA guidelines, there's a whole section talking about the non-suppressed populations and the need to set up a separate clinics for these individuals. Once you go to identify locations uh, where they are and so on, there is a strong recommendation to set up a, a separate uh, clinic to make sure that their needs are understood. If you, if you look at what I shared in terms of the, the, the high-level viral cascade, there was a huge drop from the first it has adherence counseling to second to third, which means that someone needs to pay attention to these people's need. Uh, once there's that sort of loss to follow up, it means that there's only issues with less attention paid to these patients. So we have that uh, uh, mentioned in the COP guidelines and it's a strong recommendation to ensure that there's a special menu of care for them. Over. Thank you. Uh, Francesco Marinucci is asking, uh, how the forthcoming TB and TB reef INH molecular assay on conventional platform will change the narrative around TB testing coverage, HIV TB co-infection and TB case finding? I, I think that that is a good question. And I think it's coming up, as we said, um, uh, the menu for TB over the years has been the genus, but we see more recently with Roche and other platforms coming, and that is where we are really paying attention to multiplexing and to make sure our programs are ready to embrace this. It's going to change the dynamics, and I see it in a very, very positive sense because there's a whole lot of fear from the TB community about the fact that once we continue to use the gene expert for viral and other menus, it's going to affect TB testing. And we saw it, I mean, COVID. Uh, the outcome is that I think TB programs suffer a lot during COVID. So the more we have all these menus coming up, the better for the entire program. So think about a menu that is integrated and is multiplexing once this become available. I know WHO and others, uh, the, the manufacturers are working seriously on this. Yeah, so in the same light, it says you should update your slides to B because Abbott now has both TB and TB Reef INH assays on the M2000 platform. Yes, I know that one. I, I, that slide has not been updated because uh, you shared the slide during the COVID and uh, we, we're working on that. So thank you so much uh, for that uh, updated. I, I just pulled out from one of the old slides. Definitely things have changed a lot, you're right. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth Carter is asking, what are the potential solutions or recommendations for capturing viral load testing of pregnant women? Meaning women who are recently pregnant but are getting viral load test after birth. Now, there's a whole lot of discussion with us about uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women because we've been wondering what is going on over the years. One of the principal things that I, I said we've seen is that for a lot of country programs, these women do have results, but they are classified as adults and then creating some of the confusion. So we think about setting up, uh, the, reviewing the, the laboratory data collection system or wherever this data is collected in such a way that the viral load um, for these women is captured as such. Uh, rather than including the general population. But again, there's still some issues about beyond birth. For our PEPFAR program, particularly if you look at after birth and pregnant, uh, we don't have an indicator at this point for the, the, the breastfeeding women. So in terms of the, the coverage for breastfeeding women, we don't have that, but our team, our, our committee of practice is working and updating that. And I think down the road, we need to improve that data capturing so that at all points, nothing is missing, but pay attention to what is available now just as these women are pregnant, the data system that I have in place should be able to disaggregate and then classify them as such. Okay. Dr. Pascal is asking about HCV infection, that they are generally among older population, contrary to HIV. Hence the entry point for HIV versus HCV are different. Would this be a barrier for integrating testing with HIV? from a programmatic perspective. Yeah, so we, we pay more attention to the HIV um, based on the, um, the resources. But again, as I said, the PEPFAR 
uh, funding and even global fund or other funding is meant for country to leverage resources. So if the country is developing its menu in terms of diagnostics for diseases, you have to really determine what is the best uh, entry point for HIV and HCV and so on. So it's open, it's left for the country program to leverage those resources. So there is no restriction to say this is perfect funding. So we cannot um, give that restriction, but the menu comes in and think about, I get it, it's not going to be at the same time, but the country program has developed a diagnostic program, uh, both in terms of the, the prevention and care and so on, think about what are the different entry points for different diseases and make sure that it's captured accordingly. But that can all happen if we move away from silo testing to multiplexing, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Daniel Kimani is asking about the high viral load cascade by South Sudan. He says it was impressive, but do they have a longitudinal data tracking system? Um, I don't have that information. I don't know if there's someone from South Sudan, but it's a good beginning, but very important as we talk about the register and the tracking system. I don't know what they have in place. Um, if uh, Is there any colleague on the call from South Sudan? Uh, what about any other country program here that is South Sudan? Because this is an example of South Sudan. I'm sure, Dan, you from Kenya, you have something to share with us. Can you tell us about the Kenya experience? Because I know you do a lot. And anyone from Uganda is, is something I want to want to learn, but we are so excited to see that those, those high viral load caskets are being constructed. Dan, over. Okay, Dan, you can raise your hand and then we can unmute, unmute you and anybody from South Sudan or any other country that has a similar experience. So once they raise their hand, we will give them the opportunity, but uh, we can continue with the questions. Uh, Dr. Ernest Makoa is asking if your recommendation is that countries with a wide footprint of conventional CD4 equipment should abandon them in favor of CD4 point of care budgets. I'm not saying you should abandon that. I'm just saying that you think about a menu of uh, operational that is cheaper and easy to manage. So uh, PEFA has traditionally not supported uh, CD4, mass CD4 testing. And we know that, that those instruments are used for that. If you have those uh, instruments and they're being used, then someone is funding them. You, we can't stop it, you just have to continue. What we are saying that to fill additional programmatic gaps using uh, PEFA funds, consider the use of those at uh, the point of care and rapid uh, test right and conventional instrumentation. We can't stop that, right? Because it's only doing well. So continue with what you are doing. And then if you have any other programmatic gaps, uh, consider something that is uh, more uh, cost effective. Over. Thank you. So Diana Dasi is asking, will you advise a real-time follow-up of viral load EID transport, probably through a sample tracking app? If so, what are some of the challenges one should expect? Uh, what is the question, Some follow-up? Uh, what is the question? It's, it's about uh, real-time follow-up of viral load. Hello? Are you getting me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Get you. <laughs> Yeah, they saw there was uh, some mix up. So I didn't get the question. So I let me just, I don't know what, I don't get it, but um, the, the issue about the sample, the results return, uh, is that what you're talking about? Results return is becoming very, very important. And I uh, hear Pascal on the call, and we'll be having this call also with Elsa about how to improve result return because that is very, very critical for all the programs. We've seen that a lot of results are just left in laboratory or they get to the facility and the patients themselves are not informed. But wherever a patient is sitting there and waiting and saying, my sample, was collected, what have they done with it? If that patient get just information, a text message that your results are ready, that patient will definitely want to be at the clinic next day. We've seen that work in some countries. I think you, um, Zimbabwe and Iswatini and some countries are actually using the text message approaches and they actually use it now to release and uh, to, 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 to return uh, COVID-19 results. So it's working so well. So um, Pascal, I don't know, do you have anything to add to this? Well, I think that, that that's a good point, uh, George. And I think that the, the ASLM lab Corp is looking to that question very carefully uh, as part of the, the MLE sub-community of practice and, and those intervention that we could possibly pilot in some of the countries that would be ready. So yeah, we, we are looking into this. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, the other question is from Milimo Hamomba. And uh, 
It's asking what PEPFAS position on provision of power backup to support POC testing, hub labs and satellite facilities, power backup. So we know that um, the POC, they, they should be devised that most around, I'm sure you're talking about a near point of care or what they're talking about, but um, PIPFAR will support whatever it takes uh, to, to, to run samples, right? So we will not support uh, instrumentation, not support power backup. So it's left for the country program. If that is what it takes, then you need to do that. I mean, in all the programs, we also have a system to protect and ensure that there's constant supply of electricity and so on. We invested a lot in country programs in ensure that there's a continuity and no power interruption with UPS and all that stuff. So we would definitely support it at country level if that is what it takes to run the program. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kimani, I saw your hand. I've made your co-host so you can unmute. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, LMG. I just wanted to comment that uh, we have very impressive national uh, dashboard that looks at uh, the major indicators, virus suppression, TAT, and rejection rates. But in terms of following the uh, individual patients, that's what I was saying, that would be a challenge. It would call for a very close uh, lab clinical interface so that you know that this particular patient is the same one that came for enhanced adherence counseling for a second viral load and being switched to second line. So you would need a very good, either an interaction between the lab information system and the EMRs, clinical EMRs, to really be able to create that um, cascade at the national level. Thank you. Thank okay, you. and uh, thank you. I think uh, it fall back to uh, what uh, Pascal requested and my response that you need to consider this as a subpopulation and also even be able to map out and know where they live and have a special clinic for them. If you don't do that, it will be difficult for you to follow up the patient. You are right. So you definitely have to install special clinics for advanced disease patients and get to know them better. Please, let's Leave, walk away from this long distance patient a provider relationship to client centered and community based. If we don't get down to the community and really get to knowing these people using the community based organization, so we will never get there. So, programs are walking away from that sort of long distance relationship between patients and provider uh, to client centered and community based approaches. So, let's see this as a way forward. If not, uh, most of our program will be stagnant. Over. Okay, thank you. I see we are almost at the top of, our, of the hour. Now let's take a, a couple more. Uh, Linda Chiteswa is asking, what has necessitated PEPFAS reduced support to chemistry and hematology? Um, what has uh, necessitated that is uh, what has necessitated programs over the years, the need for PEPFAR to work with country programs and begin to transition programs from time to time. So over the years at the earlier part of PEPFAR, it was necessary to do everything, but more with time, we realized that um, programs are able, country programs and ministry of health themselves are able to support some of those things that are not very expensive. Remember, chemistry and hematology are not as expensive as CD4, or as, sorry, as uh, viral load and EID and all those complex testing. They also need to move more funding for medication and so on. So we are just saying, we're not saying they're not important, but uh, insofar as they remain important, let um, other stakeholders or uh, ministry be able to take responsibility for that so that as funding continue to transition to country programs they take ownership i'm sure city4 can be huge uh, i mean i'm sure varalo can be huge but now they still have that bigger support so uh, the transition is not now it's happening like five six years ago we are surprised that uh, looking at our program now just about two or three of our perfect supported countries are still doing this this is not something that is common but again exceptionally we'll be supporting um, creatinine testing which is important for uh, people enroll into PrEP. That is just one chemistry test that we feel that is critical. If not, it may affect the PrEP um, uh, participation or PrEP uh, programs. Thank you. Over. Okay, Samuel is asking what testing will be included in the global request for proposal? Is it only limited to viral load? What, which is the global request for proposal? I mean, the, the word, um, I don't know. So, like, I mean, within the PrEP program, as I said, um, they're going to have what they call the fast commodity, things that the program will support, of course, the viral load remains all the time. You have to support viral load. You have to support um, 
the case finding, HIV diagnostic, recency testing, PrEP that I talk about. And chemistry is limited, chemistry, uh, I mean, uh, chemistry is limited to creatinine. CD4 is limited to uh, the point of care to support advanced diseases. There's crypto, there's TB LAM and all that stuff. They're all there, uh, well aligned the COP guidelines. Over. Okay, thank you. So we'll tackle the last two questions and those that are not answered, we'll be able to forward to George to provide answers which we can share later. So the second last question is from Fatim Jalo. She's asking, thanks again, George. Can you explain why the focus is only on two months uh, not consider the WHO 2018 infant testing guidance include NAT at nine months as well? Oh no, I, if I did not talk about nine months, Fatim, that is a big um, omission on my part. In the COP guidelines this year, we have included the nine months testing. Remember, WHO made a recommendation in 2016 for us to do a rapid diagnosis at nine months, which uh, we've seen, of course, WHO came back in 2018 to say that because of uh, the transmission dynamics, of course, are also breastfeeding. Children can be infected at nine months, but also because of the fact that they are on prophylaxis, the viral load may be low, and if the viral load is low, the antibodies will be low, and then rapid diagnosis will not be the way to go. So the current COP guideline has a very strong recommendation for programs to consider not at nine months. So uh, if I did not mention that, it's an error, sorry. Okay, thank you. The last question is from Nancy Bowen from Kenya. She's asking if there is an agreed price for point of care cartridges for both EID and viral load at global level that is not pegged on volumes. Um, uh, that is a good question. I, we are working on that. Uh, just again, for the good news, for those who don't yet know, at this point, as I speak, we already uh, have um, an all-inclusive discussion going on with Safiad for their platform. The MPMA is also in discussion about the point of care um, uh, or inclusive uh, pricing. Uh, it's a little bit challenging. We've been pushing forward uh, that please just have this instrument in country, but keep on saying that. Let's talk about some numbers in terms of the volume commitment, even though we may not get there, but we need some numbers just of our own accounting purposes and planning. So um, it's like they are not ready just to float the instruments and say, use it, but that number I was coming, but I don't think that should be a way to really hindering your progress, right? Um, and it can always be arranged, but it's part of the menu of discussion that are coming up. Well, thank you, George. So I'll, I'll give you uh, a minute to conclude with any statements before we end. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much again to the African Societal Laboratory Medicine and everyone. It's a great uh, opportunity for us to continue to work together with everyone. The PEFA program is open and transparent, as I said. Now in country discussions are ongoing. Be part of it. We we'll look forward to any recommendation, any suggestion. Uh, thanking all the stakeholders, Global Fund, uh, Unity, Chai. I don't just want to mention names because I'll forget somebody. It's been a great uh, moment working with everyone and with the PEPFA program. Remain supportive. It's the period of COVID, which is going to be challenging for all of us. Our uh, program this year is virtual. At this point, we should have been in country, but it's virtual. So please uh, stay safe and um, take care of yourself and make sure that you do the best to support programs wherever you find yourself. So thank you and looking forward to next time. Thank Over. you, George. I, I hope these countries have gotten solutions and we have seen that some of the solutions are available within us. So we'll be following up with the countries that have demonstrated best practice. And just to announce that tomorrow we have a, a special COVID-19 session on the use of uh, antigen tests for COVID-19. So please tune in at 4 p.m. Uh, Addis Ababa time. Otherwise, thank you for attending and have a good day.